Um, all right, so there's a nice crowd here, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight, uh, for this evening, so I'll show you what we're going to be discussing tonight would be called uh, Brahma Charya, which could be translated as Brahma practices. That's what the word literally means. This is Brahma, which we're going to talk about Brahma. And then Charya. Charya is actually kind of a basic word. It, it kind of means to do something in a way. Uh, but then it, in a religious context, we would talk about it as a practice. So let, let me just cut right to the chase. <laughs> so that word, Brahmacharya, has, um, well, it's a very kind of significant word for a lot of reasons. So we're actually going to be spending a lot of time tonight talking about all kinds of ideas that have to do with this. Um, and actually, the point is, is that this word, it refers to a pre-Buddhist practice. You might think of it as what would be called Brahmanism, if you know about Brahmanism. So in India, like the kind of indigenous religion of India, right? What would be called Hinduism, kind of. Well, the sort of the priestly caste or priestly class of that indigenous Indian religion, well, those priests are called Brahmins. And the Brahmacharya, the practice or the way of Brahma, it kind of refers to Brahmanism, or at least a, a very, very, very particular aspect of being a Brahmin. And that particular aspect of being a priest or being a Brahmin is being celibate. <laughs> so surprise, tonight we're going to talk a little bit about the idea of celibacy in Buddhism. Uh, as usual, I plan to complicate this idea to the utmost uh, in, that, in that way, to, we, to the point where we don't even know what we're talking about anymore. Um, but it all begins with this word brahmacharya. So what happens is, is this word which connotes the kind of celibate lifestyle of a Brahmin priest, it carries over into the world of Buddhism, where one who has taken monastic vows is practicing brahmacharya. But in particular, they are observing celibacy. And the reason why we know this, let me just give you a little background on this. The reason why we know this very, very clearly, like we, we, there's no question about what the word brahmacharya means regarding celibacy, because if you choose to become a monastic, a, a monk or a nun, there are well over 200 precepts that you agree to observe in order to be a monastic. It's close to 250 in some traditions, but there's four precepts, the top four the, of the 200 plus rules. The top four are the ones that actually, if you break them, get you removed completely, what, what they would call excommunicated. Those four are, top of the list is sexuality. In, in fact, even uh, for male, for, monast for male monastics, it's about the intentional emission of semen. So it's not even about sexual intercourse, it's actually about ejaculation in that sense. That's number one. Number two is taking what is not given, otherwise known as stealing. Three is the rule against ahimsa or violence, in particular, homicide. It doesn't usually include all forms of killing, just usually homicide. 
And then the fourth is actually bra bragging about having supernatural powers, not having supernatural powers, but just bragging about having them. <clears throat> so of those four, the very, 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 very first one, like kind of the top of the list, is this rule against sexuality, again, uh, against sort of like letting loose sexual energy in that way. And you know what that rule is called? Ah, brahmacharya. <laughs> so, so not being in accord with brahmacharya. And the reason why I point this out is that some, some interpreters would include, you know, it's, a, it's mora brahmacharya is morality, <clears throat> like morality in general. But that would include stealing, that would include violence, that would include all these things. And it's only the very first of the rules that's referred to as abrahmacharya. And if you do the digging, if you do the research, it's very clear within the Buddhist literature that the word brahmacharya refers to sexuality. So let's break that down. Let's talk about that. So I'm going to begin tonight, and I have, I have big expectations for the arc of tonight. So we're going to start all the way back at the time of the Buddha. So I want to go back to kind of like the earliest records, the earliest forms of Buddhism. So we're going back to about 500 BC. That's the given time frame for the Buddha. And the, the Buddhists, which at that time, it, to be a Buddhist was to be a, a celibate monastic. It, Buddhism would eventually change and kind of include both the lay supporters and the monastics. But in the early days of the Buddha, it definitely seemed like to be a Buddhist was to be a renunciant. And so in that early form of Buddhism, they're talking about brahmacharya. So what does that mean, though? Like, why, why is it called brahmacharya? Like, what's going on with all of that? So this is where it starts to get very interesting. I've mentioned a few times, you may recall, you might not recall, but Within the world of kind of, well, within the world of Buddhism, but even within the world of Indian religion, culture, and philosophy, there's two god, like main gods. I, I know there's usually three. There's actually a lot of different lists and choices, but within the world of sort of Buddhist Hinduism, if you will, like that kind of overlap of Buddhism and Hinduism, there's two main gods that one should be aware of. One is Indra, also known as uh, Chakra Devanam Indra, and the other god is Brahma. Now, when I say these words gods, don't, you know, mm, you could take that a lot of different ways. I want you to know right away that I, I'm not thinking of these as gods, like divine beings, like some traditions might. I think it's helpful to think of these like kind of, you know, poetically mythological in that sense. And so regarding these two gods, Chakra Devanam Indra, is the god of the realm of desire, the Kama Datu. Whereas Brahma is the god of the realm of form. And of course, you know, there's also the formless realm. So there's the realm of desire or the Kama Datu, the realm of pure form as it's called, and then also the formless realm. In general, what they say in Buddhism is that Indra is the god of the realm of desire, Brahma is the, realm, is the god of the realm of form, 
And the person in meditation is the god of their own world when they are in the formless realm. In other words, there is sort of no god of the formless realm, but if you make it there, <laughs> you're number one, so to speak, in that sense. So I want to talk quickly about that distinction between the realm of kama, the realm of desire, and the realm of form. <clears throat> so the point is, is that if, if you remember or you recall from prior Dharma doors or prior lessons, you'll recall that the basic idea of Buddhism or one of the basic ideas of Buddhism is that there's a realm, a dimension of reality here. And that dimension of reality is called just the realm of pure form. And it's called the realm of pure form because it is the realm of just the four elements. Just looking at things in terms of earth, fire, water, and air. Just in terms of solidity, liquidity, temperature, and movement. Those are the four elements. And as I've mentioned, you could look at any object and yeah, you could think of it as a, that it has a name and maybe you think it's interesting looking or maybe you think it's whatever, something that you could use. But underneath all of that is just a solid, not, oh, look, it's, it's air. Here's not solid. Oh, and then my, my hand keeps running into something. So that's earth element, right? And so there's a way of understanding the world where there's this dimension of just things in their kind of elemental form. Again, just things in terms of solidity, liquid, temperature, and movement. But then what the mind does is projects or superimposes onto the realm of form, well, ideas of desirability. And that projection or superimposition of things like the aesthetics of things, that they're beautiful or ugly, the, the desirability of things. Do they get you kind of excited? Do you want, an, a, do you want to stare at it? Um, you know, if you take like food, in terms of the four elements, it's like, is it mushy? Is it, is it a hard? Is it this? Is it that? But in terms of liking it and wanting more, that's, that's your kamadatu, realm of the your realm of desire. And the point is, is that I would have an entirely different reaction to, the, to things that I'm eating that you might. And so there's a way in which our kamadatus, our realms of desire, are very much our own most intimate realms because they're uniquely what we, we desire in that way or don't desire and so on. But the idea is, and I want to remind everybody that I'm talking about very early Buddhism here. So ideas of emptiness, tathata and suchness, that's all way down the road. So we're still dealing with an early form of Buddhism. And what I mean by that is that in the early form of Buddhism, the realm of form was basically kind of the same for everybody. But what people projected or superimposed onto that realm of form, that's where people's experiences of reality shifted or differed. So the idea was, is that if you could clear away the, the hazy fog of the realm of desire, you could see the realm of pure form that, that's there anyways. But the mind is clouded with all of this superimposition, superimposition and projection in that way. 
So the point is, is this. Chakra, Chakra Devanam Indra. You know, Chakra or Indra is the god that carries the, uh, the Vajra, the thunderbolt weapon, right? And I always like to make this analogy. It's not even an analogy. It's like a comparison. In the Greek, uh, in the Greek mythological tradition, there's a god named Zeus. And Zeus is the god of the sky, just like Indra. And Zeus also carries a thunderbolt weapon, just like Indra. And Zeus is known to be one who likes to party. So Zeus is a reveler. Zeus likes fornication. If you study your Greek mythology, you will know that Zeus is, is all about it in that sense. And so there's a lot of parallels, interestingly, between Indra, who is also, again, the god of the realm of desire, also is known to have hundreds of thousands of consorts or wives in that way. And so there's an interesting parallel going on there in terms of the ruler or the god of the realm of desire. Now, one big aspect to the realm of desire is sexuality. It's one of the big things about the realm of desire. Because when we see someone or we see certain images, and they maybe, uh, you know, generate interest, <laughs> generate excitement. The idea is, is that, that that excitement that one gets from seeing an image of someone or seeing someone, that's the kamadhatu, that's the realm of desire. And of course, you may know that kama, K-A-M-M-A, even though that word means just desire in general, you probably know that word from the famous non-Buddhist sutra, the Kama Sutra. And that's right, the Kama Sutra, which is, again, not a Buddhist text, but it's a sutra, a teaching, a, a discourse about sexual pleasure, sexual gratification. It's a sutra, a discourse about Kama. So even though there are a lot of things to desire here in the realm of desire, food and entertainment and all kinds of other things, sexuality seems to be the number one thing in the realm of desire. And in terms of this getting all excited, there's sort of two things going on with that. One is that if you, well, let me just insert something here for the sake of time. There is within the world of, say, yoga, definitely within the world of Buddhism, within the world of Brahmanism, there is a, an interest, I won't call it a desire, but an interest in transcending that hazy cloud of the realm of desire. There's an interest in getting to the realm of form. From the Buddhist point of view, the realm of desire is just dukkha. The realm of desire is just suffering. <laughs> I know it feels good from time to time. <laughs> I know all of that. But the general teaching, the first noble truth, is that the realm of desire, it's all dukkha. And so the real joy, the real pleasure is to be found in the realm of pure form. Who was the god of the realm of pure form again? <laughs> That's right, Brahma. And interesting, those Brahmins, the Brahmin priests of, the, of Hinduism, of the Vedic tradition, they too were trying to get closer to Brahma 
they too were practicing and doing practices to elevate them out of the realm of desire. The Buddhists, the Buddhists were too. And so they refer to those practices, in particular, the one about avoiding sexuality. They call that the Brahmacharya. So why is it called <laughs> Brahmacharya, the Brahma practice? because it's the way that you get to the realm of form. So what I want you to now, what I, I started to say a moment ago before that insertion, if one would like to get into the realm of pure form, or maybe I should put it, if one would like to clear away the cloud of the haze of the realm of desire and have the realm of form be revealed, there's a sense in which you just can't do that if you are sexually stimulated. You, there's a sense in which you can't do that if you are currently having sex and like very excited about that. And also there's an understanding that it's not just about the sexuality, it's not just about the ooh and the excitement, there's also the very important aspect of childbearing, of like the, the sexuality leading to someone being born that probably needs you to take care of it in this realm of desire. So the point is, is that from the early, early Buddhist point of view and from that br Brahminical point of view, sexuality sort of trap, traps you in the realm of desire for a number of reasons, either because of the, the stimulation or because of the reality of becoming a parent and having to do a bunch of stuff and worry about a bunch of stuff and do stuff in terms of that. And so to, and this is why I'm, I'm the reason why I wanted to take this very long time to present this is that it's not that there's anything wrong with sexuality. That's not why these Buddhists or even the Brahmins actually, it's not why they're celibate. Or at least the understanding is it's, it's not that it's bad. It's just, it's part of the realm of desire. And if one is so caught up in it, you might not even know that there's a realm of pure form to access in that way. And so part of the process, again, whether you're a Brahmin or a Buddhist monastic, part of the process is retaining that sexual energy. So let's talk about that. <clears throat> so Here's the thing about it as well. Another reason why it's not that sexuality is bad and that's why it is to be avoided. From the now, I'm actually, I want to let you know, I'm shifting totally into Buddhist mode. I'm not referring anymore to early Brahmanism, pre Buddhist stuff, but squarely within the realm of, of Buddhism. The idea is, well, I'll put it in, in some modern language. I'll kind of uh, modernize this. The Buddha or Buddhism seems to have been very, very aware, maybe even realized in some sense, but the Buddha seems to have been very aware of what we would call nowadays, he didn't call it that but we would call it evolutionary biology. And the, the point about that is, is that it's, it's a funny thing about sexuality in particular. It, there's a lot of things like this. And what I'm getting at is, well, actually, let me start you off with one that's not about sexuality. Then we'll go to sexuality. So one of the things that the Buddha seems to have recognized is that creatures, these kinds of creatures in particular, 
humans in that way, but there's a lot of them though, uh, meaning other species that do this. There's a tendency to hoard, to gather and hoard, you know, like squirrels do. You know how squirrels run around gathering nuts and they stick them everywhere. I'm always finding little piles of nuts in the weirdest places in my garden because squirrels are running around hoarding. A lot of birds hoard, lots and lots of animals gather and store and, hurt and hoard things. And the point of that is that it's a good thing that they do because when the seasons change and they can't access that food anymore, lo and behold, they have a little store of it to get them through the winter. So it is a very, very, very good habit to, to hoard and store food if you're a squirrel or a bird and all of that. And there was probably a time thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago when it was important for the you know homo sapien to hoard and store food what the buddha seems to have realized is that there is a a program and kind of an evolutionary biological program that's running that's running and dictating the behavior of this and that program is designed for millennia and millennia and millennia ago and my point is is this we hoard and store things. And the idea is, is that we have a tendency because of this evolutionary biological holdover, we have a tendency to then feel safe and secure because I've got my stockpile for the winter. So my point is, is that we do the behavior, hoard, hoard, store, store, and then I can feel safe and secure because I've done that. The problem is, is that the modern human, you know, this human, meaning the biology of this, of this being, it doesn't know about grocery stores and Uber Eats and the modern realm of food acquisition in which we live. The, this biology doesn't know about farm subsidies. <laughs> where we actually pay farmers to not grow food because we actually don't want them to grow too much. So in that world, hoarding and storing doesn't make any sense, which is why, unless you're my grandmother, most people don't hoard and store food. They hoard and store old exercise equipment in their garage. They hoard and store collectibles in their closets and then they don't feel safe and secure i better store and hoard more stuff because at some point this will make me feel safe and secure right otherwise i wouldn't have this tendency to do this right and that's what the buddha seems to have realized is that there's a program running this whole thing and it's, it's an outdated program, and because it's outdated, there are many aspects of it that's just causing us suffering. And so, better to get on top of the programming in that sense and notice, oh, that's why I'm storing all of this stuff, because I have a sense that I'll feel safe and secure if I own things. And if you realize that owning things actually will not lead to safety and security, it might somehow lead to momentary pleasures here and there, but it's not going to lead to that sense of being like secure for the winter. So when we realize that, when we realize like, oh, I'm doing these things out of a habit and they're not serving me, they're actually causing me suffering then I could stop doing that habit in that way. Another one, now I transition to sexuality. So there's a reason 
why sexuality feels so good. Even if we're just talking about masturbation, there's a reason why it feels so good. <laughs> Evolutionary biology wants you <laughs> to reproduce. <laughs> Evolutionary biology wants you to preserve the species. And the, so the idea here is, is that evolutionary biology tricked you by making these things feel so good. And what we forget is that it, it feels so good for a reason, because we wouldn't do it otherwise. And so again, we've kind of been tricked into doing that. And so there's this sense of, well, what I'm getting around to is that you, you may or may not want to have children in that sense, but your, your sort of choice about whether to do that or not doesn't have anything to do with your libido in that sense. What I'm getting at is, is that there's a rational mind that's sort of thinking about a life and whether that should include children and all of that. But your libido that would like you to have sex doesn't care about any of that. It just wants you to have as much sex as possible. And so it's this kind of drive. Of course, they call it the sex drive in that way. And, it, and for many people, it drives them crazy. <laughs> and that's what the Buddha sort of realizes. Oh, that's another one of those that one of the programs, the program of this is to be like, is to get horny and to seek sexual gratification. And where we get confused is when we think that like, oh, but it's just something I like to do. It's just something that makes me feel good. Oh, yeah, I get that. I get that aspect. But the point is, again, is, well, first of all, why does it feel good in that sense? But then it's also about from a Buddhist point of view, there's sort of no kind of better example in a way of the kind of the dukkha of things in terms of the, how could I put it? that kind of sense of the, the deep, deep, deep want, the deep, deep, deep desire to, whether it's to masturbate or to have sex. So this, to the point where it like clouds the mind for some people and it's like, oh, I can't think about anything else. And then the moment it's over, I want more, I want something else, I want something else. I, now I wanna eat something, I wanna do this. The point is, is that the feeling that, ah, oh, if I could just satisfy that sexuality, I would be so, I'd be good, I'd be satisfied. Nope, <laughs> you'll just want it again, or you'll want something else or something else. And so <clears throat> from the Buddhist point of view, being driven by our evolutionary biology in that sense, but thinking it's our own free will, Thinking, no, I just want to do this. Think again on that way. And so from the Buddhist point of view, all of that is just crazy making. And then again, if you sort of go through and start to make a family, you're going to be kind of stuck in a, in a certain realm in that way. So the Buddhists trying to get into that Brahma Vihara, trying to get into those realms of Brahma, realizes that you just can't get there if you're worried about sexuality. And again, I'm not, I, what I really wanna make clear is that sexuality isn't bad in that way. It's just, if you would like to be meditative and clear in the realm of pure form, that then there needs to be this sort of renunciation of that sexuality. Now, I'm not saying you need to be a, a renunciant. I'm not saying you need to be a monastic, I'm not saying that at all. But I am saying that 
it's going to be difficult to get into the realm of pure form. Again, if you are very, very worked up about sexuality, the two are just sort of very incongruent in that sense. So you get this idea of the brahmacharya, and now we know why it would be called the practice of Brahma, because it are the practices, and in particular, the practice of celibacy is the one that gets you into those Brahma realms. Now, of course, I would hope, you know, you go to the San Francisco Dharma Collective to meditate. The idea is, is that hopefully you're, you know, not sneaking off to the bathroom, if you know what I mean. Hopefully you're all good in that way. And so my point is, is that within a nice half hour or 45 minutes of not being sexually stimulated, one can transcend and get into those realms of pure form. But the point is, is that if one starts to get horny the next day and starts to worry and get, oh, where can I, you know, I got to find somebody, or I got to meet somebody, da, 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 just know that you're now in the realm of desire and that's where you are. <laughs> and why you're there is those desires in that way. Okay, that was a very, very long kind of etymology of the word brahmacharya. Any questions, comments, answers, or ideas about any of that? Oh yeah, no. It's um, it's a little uh, parent that or like sideways to what we're talking about. So uh, cool. I don't know if you want to answer it or or at, at length, but I, I'm just it's just talking about uh, that uh, sex leads to uh, having babies. Mm. Made me wonder about. Uh, if Buddhism has any kind of stance on having babies. I mean, some religions are really into like, yeah, have lots and lots of babies. And, and, and it seems to me like uh, there's this question of, you know, do, is, it, is it good to bring more, hmm. uh, more sentient beings into, <laughs> into existence or not? Or, or, you know, so like I said, it's a big topic. I don't feel like you need to go well into it. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's a, that's a fascinating question. Um, just because of the time for this evening and sort of the reason I brought all of this up to begin with, I'm not going to give a long answer on that. It is tricky and complicated because, and I, I kind of wanted to say this anyways, as you all may know, Buddhism started as a monastic tradition. <laughs> like I said, in the early days to be a Buddhist, was to be a celibate monastic, male or female, but celibate. Over the years though, over hundreds of years, Buddhism did sort of morph and change into a more sort of um, all-inclusive sort of tradition that had a monastic component and had a non-monastic component. My point is, is that in the early days, it was, no kids, period, period, period. But as soon as we move into like Mahayana Buddhism, where it's more of a householder type of a Buddhism, more of a city Buddhism versus the Aranya versus the forest Buddhism, as soon as you're sort of in that, all of a sudden there are families, there are Buddhist households and all of that. And the, the thing that I would say just from being uh, from spending a lot of time with East Asian Buddhists, contemporary, of course, um, the general feeling within the Mahayana realm is it's that kind of like sexuality for making babies is great, is fine, that's what it's for, but masturbation and just sort of certainly things like adultery and certainly just non-procreating sexuality is sort of, I wouldn't say it's frowned upon because this stuff gets tricky, but yeah, Noam, your question is really, really, really important and really good, but it's, again, it's not exactly where I wanted to take tonight. So I have duly noted, hope that says a little bit. Okay, you have a question? 
Let me unmute myself. Uh, thank you, Michael. Yeah. So my question is, uh, there's something I see could be similar to Seth. It's the desire for connection or intimacy. Hmm. Uh, let's say with my partner. So that's also in the realm of desire. Is it similar to the desire for sex? Is that, oh, I just want to cuddle with my partner. I just want to mm -hmm. whatever, but not sex per se. Yeah, on that, on that note, and this goes for intimacy in general, like you're asking about, but even just sexuality as well. Like, I meaning if you're in a sexual relationship in that sense, the a teaching that I give a lot about this, and I've been giving this for a really long time, I really just, I feel very strongly about this idea regarding being in any, in a relationship, an intimate relationship. I feel like generally speaking, there's sort of two ways to be in a relationship. And one way is where the partner is what we would call objectified, meaning they're a thing. And oh, this is my this is my girlfriend, mm -hmm. as if she's like an object that I own. And what we notice is, is that when we think of our partners as sort of like possessions in that way, that leads to things like jealousy, <laughs> that leads to things like irrational behavior around that. There's a way of being in a relationship where one doesn't objectify the other, but actually fully celebrates and respects them as their own being. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that other person would celebrate and respect me as my own being in that sense. And in that way, well, I guess what I'm getting at is, is that there's a way to sort of be desirous of someone as an object. And there's also then a way to love someone as a person, to care for them, to all of that. And for me, the, there's a Buddhist way to be in a relationship that's non-objectifying, and then a kind of unhealthy way where one or both people are objectifying the other. So, mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to get to what I came here to talk about. Here's what happened. We've been reading this sutra, this Manjushri Pure Land Sutra, and we've finally got, gotten around to this part where we're hearing all about the Bodhisattva Manjushri's future Pure Land. We've reached a point in the text where Manjushri started to share with us these 10 vows and these vows are these like wishes, um, not desires in that sense, but sort of aspirations. And they are aspirations for how Manjushri's Buddha land will be in the future. And last week I did the first two of these 10. They were just really quickly to give you a feel for how this sounds. The first one was about uh, Manjushri having this, this vow that all of the people that he can see with his divine eye for you know, immeasurable number, numbers of world systems in all direction. He basically says that until they all reach full enlightenment, he will not reach full enlightenment. So this is sort of that he, he will not realize final full enlightenment until all these immeasurable numbers of sentient beings have already reached full enlightenment. That's pretty a pretty standard thing for a bodhisattva to vow or wish for in that way. And then the next thing sorry, was that I have this vow, he says to the Buddha, I also have this vow to make Buddha lands equal in number to the grains of the sands of the Ganges River, all come into being one single Buddha land, adorned with immeasurable, wondrous, intermingled jewels. And if it isn't the case, 
that all these Buddha lands have become one Buddha land. If that hasn't happened, I'll never realize full awakening, he says. So those are the two I did last time. If you want to know more about those, you can check out last week's recording. But this week, I or the, tonight, I plan to do uh, Manjushri's third, fourth, and fifth vows. And it's actually the fifth of these that's going to mention Brahmacharya, the, the theme for tonight. So let me quickly run you through the third and fourth vow. The third vow is he says, furthermore, world honored one, I also have this vow that within my Buddha land, there will be a Bodhi tree as big as the universe, as big as 10, 3,000 great thousand world systems. And that tree will emit a light that pervades the entire Buddha land. Wow. <laughs> All right. So Bodhis uh, Bodhisattva Manjushri's Buddha land is going to have a tree of enlightenment, a Bodhi tree that's as big as 10 universes, basically. Okay. Vow number four. Furthermore, world honored one, I have this vow. Upon sitting underneath that tree of awakening, and upon realizing and attaining final Anuttara Samyak Sambuddhi and finally entering Nirvana, I will not rise from that seat, but merely by miraculous transformations will I pervade immeasurable numbers of Buddha lands throughout the 10 directions and broadly expound the Dharma for all sentient beings. Okay, so this is getting pretty serious, right? This is uh, Manjushri's vision of his Buddha land, right? So it's, it's a Buddha land that consists of all these other Buddha lands brought together into one Buddha land. It's adorned with all of these marvelous intermingled jewels. And there's a giant Bodhi tree. And when Manjushri sits in that Bodhi tree, he's going to attain full enlightenment and never rise from that seat but just go around, he's just gonna go around teaching by miraculous transformations. Wow. But now we get to the fifth one. So I gotta tell you, before I read this, when I first read this, I was gonna skip it. I didn't even wanna go there. It was one of those things, it, it comes up a lot, it comes up often, not often, but enough, it comes up in these pure land sutras. And so it pops up here. And again, I was going to avoid it at first. And I'm really glad I didn't because, well, let me read it to you. I think you'll know why I hesitated to do this. Furthermore, world honored one, I also have this vow that within my Buddha land, there will not be even the name woman. Just bodhisattva beings free of defiling afflictions, totally pure in brahmacharya, wearing monastic robes the moment they are born, appearing spontaneously seated cross-legged. Bodhisattvas like this will be found throughout my Buddha land. And there are not the names voice hearer or pratekya buddha either, except for when the Tathagata is explaining the Dharma of the three vehicles to sentient beings throughout the 10 directions by means of miraculous transformations. Okay, so this sutra, at, at least here, the wording of it is, is helpful. So of course, I'm referring to this idea that within Manjushri's Buddha land, there won't even be the name woman. So this comes up, like I said, a number of times in various Pure Land Sutras. And how this basically usually gets 
I want to say the way it gets translated, the way it gets interpreted, is that there are no women allowed in pure lands, that pure lands are places with no women. That's the way it sometimes sounds, and it's why I sometimes just choose to avoid this aspect of pure lands. But I didn't want to do it tonight because I wanted to really, you know, I've been going through this sutra pretty meticulously. But I've actually like, it's not that I've had a change of heart or a change of my understanding of this has always been the same. But I just, I found a, a very nice entry point for how to talk about this. And if I'm successful, what I'm hoping is, is that actually these sections that you hear in Pure Land Sutras about no women, my hope is, is that after this explanation, we'll see how this is not only not derogatory, but actually empowering. Let's see if I can do that. So one of the things to keep in mind is that Manjushri, this bodhisattva who has this vow to have a pure land without the word woman. This bodhisattva Manjushri, of course, appears in many, many Buddhist sutras. And as everybody knows, I don't really teach these sutras as if Manjushri was a historical person. Most of you know that. I teach sutras allegorically and meaning symbolically. And so symbolically, allegorically, Manjushri represents pranya, the wisdom of emptiness. Now, just because Manjushri wasn't a historical person, or he might have been a historical person, some people think there was a person named Manjushri. I don't, I think that's sort of neither here nor there. But as an allegorical figure, when Manjushri appears in all of these different sutras, he always has the same message. So my point is, is that he's, he's a consistent character within the sutras. And one sutra in particular that I think, well, I know it's, it's very, very important, very relevant to this section, one sutra where Manjushri is the star of the show, or he is a star of the show, is this famous Vimalakirti Sutra, the Vimalakirti Nirdesha Sutra. So many, a few years ago, uh, I did a series for the San Francisco Dharma Collective on the Vimalakirti Sutra, really, really important Mahayana Buddhist Sutra. Like I said, Manjushri is sort of the main bodhisattva of that sutra and a bulk of that sutra is discourses between this guy vimalakirti a householder and manjushri so well hopefully you've read you've read the sutra or you know about the sutra but i want to remind you or tell you about a really important moment that happens in the sutra it happens in chapter seven and that chapter, at least in the uh, Sanskrit Tibetan, that chapter is called the goddess. And it's called the goddess because it's a funny, it's a funny moment. It's a funny moment because in the sutra, Manjushri and Vimalakirti are having this super high level intellectual debate about, well, it's about the nature of emptiness in regards to viewing sentient beings. So it's this really heavy Dharma discourse discussion about in light of emptiness, how does a bodhisattva regard or view sentient beings? And so they're going off at this really high intellectual level. I would suggest that it's a very masculine debate. It's very kind of two men 
going at it back and forth and back and forth. And I actually think it's intentionally written to be rather um, masculine in that sense, because right kind of at the peak of this conversation between these two men, this goddess appears, a, a Devi. And this Devi, hearing the Dharma being explained by everybody, starts showering the audience with these flowers. And this funny thing happens, you probably know, all these flowers start to stick to all of the monks. <laughs> all of the bodhisattvas in the audience, the flowers just fall right off. But all the monks are getting stuck with all these flowers. And all the monks are really uncomfortable. So they, they, they try to take the flowers off, but they can't remove them. And they even try to use their siddhis. They even try to use their supernatural powers and they still can't remove the flowers. And the goddess asks Shariputra, a voice hearer, one of the monks, why are you trying to take off these flowers? And Shariputra says, it's not appropriate for monastics to wear flowers. And that's true. It's one of the 10 precepts, like one of the, those 10 initial precepts that every uh, Buddhist actually takes in a way, but monastics. And it's the prohibition against wearing garlands, flowers, wearing flowers in your hair, wearing perfumes, wearing adornments. There's a rule against wearing adornments. And so this, this funny scene, and it's, it's very allegorical, where, the, where Shariputra is wearing a garland and he's trying to take it off. And he says, well, it's inappropriate for me to wear this. And although they're talking about wearing flower garlands, there's a kind of an underlying discourse about all of the precepts by which you could throw in their sexuality too. So just, just be, let it be known that even though they're just talking about the rule about flowers, there's a larger conversation going on. And ultimately what the goddess says to Shariputra is that he, well, he says, it's not appropriate for one who has gone forth into Buddhism. It's not appropriate to wear garlands. And she says, why? And he says, because they're impure. And the goddess responds, no, 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 no. For one who's gone forth into the way of the Buddha, what's improper is thinking of things in terms of purity and impurity. Having a discriminatory mind that thinks a flower garland is impure, wicked or evil, that's not appropriate for one who's gone forth into the way of the Dharma. So Shariputra is sort of blown away by the wisdom that this goddess um, presents. And so at a certain point, Shariputra says, wow, like your wisdom is so, you know, exalt, exalted. What have you attained? Like, who are you? And in response to these questions, so Shariputra asks all these questions about the goddess's attainments. And then, and now I'm actually read, I'm going to read from this version, the BDK version. Shariputra figuring that this goddess is such high level wisdom, he eventually says, goddess, why don't you just transform your, your female form then? And that is a very particular reference. And what that reference is when he asks to the goddess, well, why don't you just change out of being a female? And he's basically saying, why don't you change and become a man? And the reason why he would be saying this is that in the early Buddhist tradition, 
So not the tradition of the Malakirti, not the Bodhisattva path, but that early Buddhist tradition, they had, and some Buddhist traditions still have this, by the way, the early Buddhist tradition had an idea that if a woman renounced, became a nun, took all 250 rules, and practiced the Dharma perfectly for the entire rest of her life, the best that she could hope for is to be reborn as a man, to do it all over again as a monk, and then have access to our hot ship. So what happens is, is that you start to get these, I would call them early Mahayana sutras. They're kind of late, late, early period or early Mahayana, like that cusp period, you start to find some of those sutras where there are women who are of great wisdom, of great accomplishments. And this thing happens, which is there, they are lauded, they are celebrated as having such wisdom. And then at the last minute, by miraculous transformation, they turn themselves into a man and then become a Buddha. So there's these early Mahayana sutras that sort of like they want to allow women to have full access to enlightenment and all of that. And they want to recognize that there are brilliant, like enlightened women, but they still kind of hold that trace idea of that early Buddhism. And so to demonstrate that, they demonstrate power by turning themselves into a man. <laughs> so like they, they get to keep their power, but they still defer it a little bit. <laughs> so it's complicated. Those early Mahayana sutras that deal with it that way are complicated. The Vimalakirti Sutra is talking about those traditions where the female must turn themselves either literally in terms of rebirth or figuratively in terms of miraculous transformation, Shariputra is referring to that. And so he's saying, well, why don't you just turn into a man then? Why, do you, why don't you just transform your female form? Now the goddess replies, and you need a little backstory about this really quickly. If you don't know, Vimalakirti, who is the star of this sutra, it's this whole sutra is really funny, and it's all about Manjushri and the gang, all of these bodhisattvas, all of these monks, Shariputra, all these people. They all come over to this guy, Vimalakirti's house, because he's sick. So they all come over to check on him to make sure he's doing okay. Vimalakirti is a bodhisattva himself, quite an accomplished one. And so he does this really interesting thing in that sutra. Right before everybody comes over to his house, he makes everything empty. There's no chairs, there's no art, all of his uh, like uh, servants and all of his staff disappear, everything is gone. He turns his, his house into emptiness. And it's a really funny, again, allegorical teaching where all of these bodhisattvas and even people like Shariputra are in this house of emptiness. And they're all discoursing and talking about this Buddhist teaching of emptiness. And so Shariputra, at an earlier part when the goddess first shows up, Shariputra asks the goddess, how long have you been living in this house? And she eventually says that she's been living in this house for 12 years. And most people, like if you interpret the sutra where 
Well, most people kind of refer or think that that refers to this person, this goddess, having basically been practicing Mahayana Buddhism, having been practicing the Bodhisattva path, having been practicing emptiness for 12 years. And that's what it means that she's been living in the house of the Malakirti for that long. So when Shariputra asks the goddess, why don't you just change your female form? She responds by saying, for 12 years now, I've been looking for the characteristics of being female. And I have comprehended, and I have comprehended that they are unattainable. Why should I transform it? It's, it's as if a magician has created or conjured up a female. If someone asked her, why don't you transform your female body? Would that person's question be appropriate or not? Shariputra replies, it would not. Okay, I'll finish reading that a little bit, but I want to talk about that right there. So the goddess says, I've been looking for these characteristics of a female for 12 years now, and I can't find them. So that right there, the idea of the characteristics of being a female and not being able to find them. So we, of course, in the Dharma doors, we do a lot of talking about Lakshana, about characteristics. And lately, I've been working a lot with this one, what I call the big cup, little cup example. So the idea here is, is that in terms of characteristics, this is a really short, quick example of the tricky nature of characteristics. And what that is, is, is that if I show you these, you might be inclined to think that this is a little cup. And when I say that, what I mean is, is that you might be inclined to think that this has the characteristic, a characteristic of this is that it's little. And a characteristic of this then is that it's big. Now, what I show you, of course, is this. And I say, okay, so this is the big cup, right? This one. And you go, no, 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 no. That's the big cup. This is the little cup. And I say, but wait a minute. I thought this was a big cup. Like I thought the, a characteristic of this cup is that it's big. You told me that a second ago, right? It's big, right? And right there we realize that this and this, that the characteristic of their size doesn't reside in this. This is not small. Relative to this, it is small. But that is occurring in the mind of the beholder. It's not actually out here. Littleness is not a quality of this. Although I know that this looks like it's a little cup. We can also do this for the color. Because if I asked you which of these was the light colored one and which is the dark colored one, you would probably be inclined to say that this is the light colored one, right? So hand me the light colored one. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> no, wait, this, that, that's not the light colored one. This is. So size, color, also relative, not inherent in the object. Now, if we push this a little further, I could ask you what shape you think this is in. And now we're getting to a characteristic that would seem to be inalienable from this, that this is just spherical or not spherical, cylindrical, right? 
But the idea is, it is, it is cylindrical relative to this shape. But guess what? This is square relative to this shape. Now, the point is, is again, is that all of these distinctions are happening in the mind of a beholder. But where we get confused and deluded is thinking that they're characteristics of these objects. If you're following me on that, and that should be old hat for people coming to Dharma doors. But now we take it beyond big cup, little cup. And what we begin to realize is that the characteristics of being a male, for example, are only going to make sense in the mind of a beholder relative to the female. Now, the point is, is that I know that the characteristics of like having a beard, the characteristics of maybe a deeper voice, the character, all these different characteristics are what we culturally, culturally constructed, what we would think of as aspects or characteristics of being male. But the point is, I know, I know that you might think that this is a little cup and that you might think that this is a male human. But the point is, is that if you can understand how this is not little or big, but standing next to whatever, the mind of a beholder would think it's small. Well, standing next to a female in that sense, in the mind of a beholder, they would say that, that's the male one. What the goddess has just said is what I just broke down for you regarding characteristics. The characteristics of being male or female are not here. They're in the discriminatory mind of a beholder. The goddess, having lived in the house of emptiness for 12 years, says she's been looking for these characteristics of being a woman and can't find them. It's as if a magician had created a female. And then somebody asked, why don't you change into a male? What sense would it make? It's not a real female in that way. Shariputra says, yeah, it wouldn't make any sense to ask the magically created woman to change her form. The goddess says, all dharmas, all phenomena are also like this in being without determinant or fixed characteristics. So Shariputra, why do you ask me about transforming my female body? And then just because it's my favorite part of this sutra, and if you don't know this, you got to hear it. Then the goddess, the goddess uses her supernatural powers and changes Shariputra's body into her body of a goddess. And she transforms herself into the body of Shariputra and then asks Shariputra, why don't you transform your female form? Shariputra, in the form of a goddess, answers, I don't even know how I got transformed into a goddess. How could I transform out of it? The goddess said, Shariputra, if you were able to transform this female body, then all females would also be able to transform themselves. Just as Shariputra is not female, but is manifesting a female body, so are all females likewise. Although they manifest female bodies, they are not female. And then the goddess withdraws her power and things return to the way they were, meaning the goddess does not stay in the form of Shariputra in that way. Okay.
So I wanted to share that section with you. Again, Manjushri is right there, right next to Shariputra and the goddess as this discourse is happening. And it's in the context of that conversation that I understand this vow of Manjushri. And in fact, it's unfortunate because the other translations um, of which, you know, there's these two other English translations, they miss this really interesting piece of language. And it's this language where Manjushri says, I also have this vow that within my Buddha land, there will not be the name woman, just bodhisattva beings. The other translations don't, they choose to sort of not mention that. <laughs> and so the point is, is that actually, and if you read the Tibetan version, which is the 84,000 dot read version that we sometimes put up, if you read that version, they, they lean even further into the idea that, that Manjushri's pure land is like a no, no women allowed kind of a space. And that's unfortunate because in the Chinese version and even in the, the other, this one, the Chang version that we sometimes read, it's, it's not about women. It's about the actual label, like the distinction of that. And then we get the rest of this. The rest of this is that, and this is important too, the rest of this says, thanks for that, Noam. The rest of this says that the bodhisattvas in Manjushri's Buddha land, they're going to appear spontaneously, already sitting full lotus in monastic robes, fully doing brahmacharya in the realm of pure form, that is, right? So that's another aspect of like why why no word woman well it has to do with and this is what i mean by you could potentially read this as very empowering because in the other pure land sutras and i've i've read a few of them in dharma doors when it mentions this thing about pure lands not having women there's even a way, let me see here. Right, the Tibetan version actually says it. Um, it still says it's not going to have any women, but it makes it clear that it talks about how because there's not going to be any womb birth. So what I'm getting at is, is that I think it's important to keep in mind a kind of a, a cultural mentality, a cultural, an old world cultural mentality that kind of views the role of women as reproducers. The idea of, well, what is a woman? A woman is there to have a baby. A woman is there to reproduce. So when Manjushri says, you know what? In my Buddha land, there's not going to be women just bodhisattvas. When I read that, I, I, I want to tell you, when I really read that and I was really thinking about this Dharma talk tonight, an image that came to mind, I, as I said, uh, at, at some point this evening, I mentioned that I've spent a lot of time with East Asian Buddhist communities. In particular, I've spent a lot of time in East Asian Buddhist monasteries in Taiwan, in Japan, and particularly in Taiwan, the monasteries that I was staying at had very large female and male um, monastics. And you know, of course, male or female, shave their head. Male or female, they wear the same robes. Male or female. What I'm getting at is, is that 
at first glance, <laughs> a monk and a nun start to look a lot alike in a Buddhist monastery, just at first glance, of course. But I mean, you know, the robes really kind of, they're so big and flowy. They really cover up the actual bodily form. Once you have a shaved head and all of that. So the times that I've spent in Buddhist monasteries, I definitely felt as if I was among bodhisattvas. Not men, not women or whatever, but practitioners bodhisattvas. And I feel like that is sort of, that's how I would read Manjushri's vow here. Not no women allowed in my, mon in my pure land, but actually in my pure land, women are not just going to be for reproduction. In my pure land, women are going to be on an equal level of all sentient beings. How about that for a pure land? That's how I read that section. Even if that's not right, I'm still going to read it that way. So. All right. Um, I haven't paused for a while. Apologies for that. Any questions, comments, answers, ideas about any of this? I know this has probably been a lot. Um, I mean, if you were writing this sutra, would you have said, in my pure land, there won't be women or there won't be the name woman or the name man. It's, it just seems like that's kind of what you're getting at. Yeah. I, and I actually think that you could kind of implicitly read it that way. And it's only because of the focus on being spontaneously born rather than womb born, that that's why they focus particularly on the name woman. But yeah, no, if I were redoing it, I think the idea is, is that the, the name man shouldn't be in the pure land any more than the name woman. Oh, actually, thanks, Noam, by the way. Also, another thing that is, a, is we miss or is, is avoided, in Manjushri's pure land, there's not the name voice hearer or Pratekya Bhutta either. And those are always considered men, basically. Definitely the Pratekya Buddha is in that sense. So, if you read it that way, then Manjushri also said, yeah, no men allowed either. But he didn't say that. He said, there won't be the name voice hearer. And as I've said before, you know, a voice hearer, it doesn't mean hearing voices like you're crazy. It means being a student and always just being a student and never basically rising to the level of a teacher, which is what makes the Bodhisattva path the Bodhisattva path. Any other questions, comments, answers, ideas, realizations? I would really like to think I didn't offend anybody trying to do that because it's such a delicate topic. Um, yeah, actually, while we're here, speaking of which, because you have it, let me just read you how the Tibetan one sounds. Manjushri says, I also have aspired that in my Buddha land, may the names voice hearer and solitary Buddhas be completely absent. May my Buddha land be populated exclusively with bodhisattvas who are devoid of anger, aggression, and hypocrisy, and who practice brahmacharya. May the very word woman be unheard of. May there be no womb birth. And may all the bodhisattvas just appear miraculously, dressed in saffron robes and seated cross-legged. May my Buddha realm be utterly pure. And may the emanations of the Tathagatas proceed into countless trillions of worlds throughout the 10 directions, teaching beings the Dharma. All right, so it's not as bad as I remembered it. It just sort of leaves not as much room for interpretation as the other one, but. All right. That's it for me then, because uh, that's what I came to say. Um, awesome, awesome. Yeah, so um, stay tuned next week and we will continue 
Manjushri has a few more vows for his pure land to cover, but 